Welcome to Forbidden Planet 42, celebrating 42 glorious years of the Forbidden Planet store in London, where we are constantly trying to answer the ultimate question to life, the universe and everything. For this session, I'm honoured to have with me the greatest radio producer, not just in the UK, not just in the USA, not just around the world, but in the history of mankind. My old pal, Mr. Dirk Mags. How are you, Dirk? I'm fine, Andy. It's so nice to, I'm, I'm so honoured to be asked uh, and it's so great to see you. We go back a little way ourselves. We and um, it's, um, you know, Forbidden Planet. Uh, who hasn't walked past Forbidden Planet and gone, oh, I wish I wasn't going to a meeting. I could spend the next two hours in there just looking at stuff. Yeah. Um, from all the, the all the way back to the days when it was down at the end of Tin Pan Alley, the end yeah. of Denmark Street, yeah. and then the new Oxford Street, and now the new location in well, new it's not a new location, but the Shaftesbury Avenue. Yeah, no, just it, it's a mecca, isn't it, really? And um, I, I'm so I'm thrilled to be asked because I love the Bin Planet, and um, it's been a part of my life, and of course everything I love. Is stuff that Forbidden Planet generally deals in, which is comic books and, you know, uh, general kind of sci-fi fun. So all, I love it. All of that great stuff. Can you, can you remember when you, um, when you first encountered Forbidden Planet back on Denmark Street back in the day? Can you remember the circumstances I, of that? I would, I would imagine the first time I came to Forbidden Planet would be not that long after it opened, around the time... I mean, not quite the time when Douglas Adams, for example, would be in there signing, uh, you know, early uh, versions of Hitchhikers. But I would think within two couple of years of that, because I was working just a mile or so away at Broadcasting House um, or down at Bush House in the Strand. So it was within walking distance. And the other thing is I'm a drummer. So yes, I would be going up to Rose Morris's showroom or... Um, uh, there was a lovely shop called All Bang and Strum It in Seven Dials, and all of it is within walking distance. So, uh, I, I, pretty early on, I walked past and thought, "What is this? They sell <laughs> this is my kind of shop." Yeah, yeah. exactly. And uh, and you mentioned then um, uh, I, I, a great friend of Forbidden Planet, and a truly great friend of yours, Douglas Adams, the creator of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, genius creator of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, who you of course go way back with. <clears throat> you work with a lot in you you know you and of course you went on to produce the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy part of this celebration is the tip of the hat to douglas so what memories can you share with me of the great man i, I was um you know i i was aware that hitchhikers was a phenomenon and when i finally listened to it properly i realized it was just so completely different from anything i'd heard before um and I arrived in the light entertainment department, which is where uh, uh, Douglas was working. And uh, Simon Brett, who did the pilot program, was, you know, a senior producer and did it. And then Jeffrey Perkins took over. I arrived in uh, 1988, having served 10 years as a sort of studio manager, which is sort of balanced engineer thing. Um, and this was the department which did Hitchhikers. And when I did uh, my early programs, the, the first thing I was given a thing called was a thing called the Long Hot Satsuma with Barry Cryer, Graham Garden, and uh, Paul B. Davis. And uh, you can, uh, titled by Barry, as you can imagine. Um, and uh, the first, our first recording, um, Alec Hale Munro, the SM, was on the panel in the, the back of the Paris, our audience studio. And somebody said to me, that's Alec Hale Munro. He recorded Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you know. So there was this sort of aura of holiness. And about a couple of years into my time at um, uh, Radio Light Entertainment as a producer, I was doing stuff like the news headlines, and I did, which is a kind of satire, end of peer satire show for Radio 2. Then I was doing, um, I did the Marx Brothers recreations called Flywheel, Shyster and Flywheel, which is still repeated a lot, which yes, very well. Yes, fantastic too. Yeah, great. Really fun stuff. Yeah. But the other thing I, I did, which I'm sure we'll come back to, is I was doing stuff based on DC Comics superheroes. Yeah. And I'd done a few things by that point. And uh, Douglas had heard it, uh, had heard the stuff. And he was, he had just written, this was in 92, he had just written Mostly Harmless, which was his last hitchhiker book. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sorry if anyone doesn't know this, so spoilers. 
um, he actually kills off the entire cast at the end of this book. Um, and I think he felt, you know, he'd absolutely dropped the boom on any more hitchhikers. And so in a spirit of nostalgia, I think he thought it'd be rather nice, given that his uh, third, fourth and fifth books had never originated as radio uh, series, if it could be brought back to the radio. So uh, he needed someone to do it. And he heard my Superman and my production style is quite cinematic and there's big music and big sound effects and so on. And I think he must have thought, well, with Jeffrey Perkins gone to television by then, this bloke might be okay. So he rang my boss. Uh, <clears throat> to say, uh, is this guy, um, Mags, you know, might it be possible you could, you know, let him do Hitchhikers? So, uh, and my boss rang me and um, and said, uh, Douglas Adams is just wrong. Would you be interested in doing Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? And I, it's sort of like, you know, it's one of those out of the blue things and you think, hmm, I think my life has just taken an upward turn. <laughs> um, so I was round at... Um, uh, you know, at his uh, at his house in Islington, uh, Duncan Terrace, uh, before you could sort of, before he put the phone down almost. I mean, I was sort of like, whoosh, yeah. it was a cartoon thing. Knocked on the door, huge great bloke comes to the door. It's Douglas, you know, he's about, and he's six, six, something like that. So yeah. I'm kind of basically looking up his nose. So, oh, hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> hello, Douglas. Um, and he said, oh, come in, come in, come in. And uh, we went upstairs to his living room state-of-the-art stereo everywhere and we had this conversation which was around uh, about two hours and I would say the first 10 minutes were about the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and the last hour and 50 minutes were all about how he played guitar and I played drums and stereo systems and have you seen my new CD player oh and this is my left-handed bass guitar like Paul McCartney said have you seen these electrostatic speakers by a quad and so in the end it turned into sort of you know um comparing toys I suppose if you like um but I, I never got to know him I, I didn't know him well because uh he was incredibly busy setting up the last chance to see thing he did about vanishing species but I went round there a few times to talk to him about it and we had a few ups and downs and in fact the first series of Hitchhikers which was meant to be recorded in summer of 93 uh, didn't happen because uh, there were contractual problems. I think Ed uh, Victor, Douglas's agent, quite sensibly was trying to get as much money out of the BBC as he could. And the BBC were going, oh, no, 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 we mustn't open the special purse. <laughs> uh, um, so that kind of died a death. And, and it was very, very sad. It, it, it was, um, uh, it, there was a problem also with the script. They, they elected a, 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 and a seasoned writer, a fine chap, lovely man, to write a script and um i mean I'll, i'm going off tangentially slightly but i'll drag it back of course and the guy wrote a script which is the third book starts on prehistoric earth where arthur dent wakes walks out of his cave and utters a scream of horror at the futility of everything because there's nothing <laughs> except trees to talk to and this guy had introduced a talking dinosaur for, for arthur dent to talk to thinking it was an amusing idea. Now, the thing about Douglas was, you know, he might invent like the infinite improbability drive or the ultimate question to life, the universe and everything. But one thing Douglas will not stick was talking dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. This was completely not on. And as a result, um, I kind of thought I heard a vague explosion in my office in Broadcasting House. <laughs> and uh, the phone rang and it was Douglas and he was, you know, it's like steam was coming out of the handset and he's saying, I've just had this, have you read this script? I said, yeah, I thought it, you've just got it from the courier that I sent it to you. He said, have you, what, what do you think of it? I said, well, to be honest with you, I, I kind of expected you to call me. He said, a talking dinosaur, there's a talking dinosaur. What? Anyway, long story short, because of that script, jammed up and Douglas really didn't want to rewrite the whole thing himself and the rights issues. It kind of died at that point. But before it died, I did plant the idea with him that maybe I could adapt it. I said, well, why don't I tell you what, you know, why don't if I get paid to do the writing, if I do the adaptation and give it to you and you read through it and make any changes you want, you can say it's by you. I don't, I don't mind not having the credit if, I, if I'm paid for the work. Um, and, and that was kind of how we left it. 
um, we met again in 97. He'd been, I worked in a studio in West London, still do, called The Sound House, which is a lovely studio, and it's really full of all state-of-the-art stuff and experienced people. And um, Douglas, I've gone, uh, uh, oh, I saw an email from Douglas about something else he sent. And I, he said, uh, oh, and you, I see your name's all over The Sound House, Dirk, because they used to put up the prizes we won. He said, um, fancy coming over to the Digital Village, which was his place in Camden where he was setting up interesting things like Starship Titanic, the game and all yeah. of that. Um, and he said, do you want to come over for a chat? So I went over and saw uh, Douglas and met his friend, uh, Robbie Stamp, who he was running it with. And Douglas was, uh, had this idea for a, a video game with, without pictures. <laughs> it's very Douglas. So, um, and basically you went there by sound alone. And and because we, you know, sort of, I, I, I did the Supermans and Batmans in surround sound. Yeah. Which originally was going to be for hitchhikers. But in okay. the end ended yeah. up being for them. Douglas said, I, I noticed, you know, you'd gone ahead with it and so on. Do you think we could do this? And, you know, so you can actually hear your way into the puzzle and out again and so on. And I said, well, I'm not sure anything's possible. But we had a chat and I think it was gradually dawning on him this probably, even if it was a great idea and done brilliantly, it probably wouldn't sell in big amounts. And at that point he said, well, maybe not, maybe not. And I said, well, look, you know, how about hitchhikers? Yeah, where are we on that? Because, I, you know, the BBC would kill for it. Oh, it's always, oh, I'm trying to get a film made, can't get a film made, you know, it's like you know, trying to get a film made is like trying to cook a steak by having a row of people breathe on it. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, that kind of, one of those famous things he said. Um, and I said, well, look, you know, I, I'm still up for writing it. And he said, okay, okay, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'll send you what I've got, because I did start it. I'd, I'd actually been round there when it all fell apart, and he was yeah. banging away at his little MacBook Pro or whatever it was in those days in the basement of the house. And he sort of and he looked up and said, I can't write this all over again. He was really, you know, sort of very cross about this bloody dinosaur anyway. Uh, and he sent me all this stuff. And I was, I literally, I think I'd got my next set of days off. I had it all ready to go that I was going to start with the tertiary phase, the third series, start writing this script. And on the, it was a Thursday night, no, a Friday night before the weekend. Uh, Sophie Astin, who was Douglas's PA, emailed me saying, Douglas, Douglas says, drop everything. Disney have just bought the rights to Hitchhikers. So everything's tied up. You can't, so don't do anything. Yeah. He sends apologies and, you know, that did anything. So and I'm just thinking, oh, for Christ, the second time this yeah. has gone down the tubes. And um, I'm philosophical about most things, Andy, but you kind of think, come on yeah uh to the fates um so everything went dead again and then 2000 year 2000 i'm walking to broadcasting house and walking my way from the lifts is douglas and there's a big oh, how are you how are you how are you i mean you know we sat down for a chat and he said you know i'm sure we will get to do this in audio i just don't know when it'll probably take some event you know to make it happen well of course the event that it took was that he died in this gym in Santa Barbara, which is just um, unbelievable. So, you know, the last situation in which I would want to make Hitchhikers happened, and it just so happened a, a mutual acquaintance was a producer, had a production company, <clears throat> and he was at the memorial service. And so there was the cast, there was this guy, had the production company, there was me who was happy to, you know, work with anyone to help me make it happen. And we finally did it in about 2004 and five. We finally did the tertiary phase, the quandary phase. This was Douglas's idea. He said, I, I think we should, like, series one is boring. Let's, let's call it primary phase for series one, secondary phase for series two, and tertiary phase for series three. And, and I'm going, yes, of course, yes, I'm just nodding like a dog. <laughs> yeah, it's Douglas Adams, what are you going to say? Anyway, by the time we got to making it, we did the tertiary phase and then we got to the fourth series, which would be the quat quaternary phase. Anyway, you said, yeah. I don't know. So I was sorry. So I just wrote quandary. I just quandary. That's, that's kind of vaguely funny. So then of course we had the fifth series and quint quint quintessential. Yeah. So it became, I just sort of, you know, in my uh, pub drummer way, simplified it to the point where I could play it. Um, <laughs> So uh, that's so we ended up making three series then, and um, 
And it was terribly sad because Douglas wasn't there. But what I was able to do, we, in the meeting we had at uh, the very first, I think the second meeting we had at Duncan Terrace where he lived, he, uh, he, he took me upstairs and he said, I want to play you this thing. I want you to tell me what you think. And I'm thinking, oh, hello, what are we going to get here? You know, is it his band with, you know, um, uh, you know, the lads who write books, what they're called, like Rocky and the Remainders yes, or something. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, and he played a bit of the audio book of, uh, of, um, uh, of Hitchhikers of the, of the third series, or of, the, of the third book of uh, Life, the Universe and everything. And it was a bit with this character Agrajag in, and he was reading it as himself. And then he did this character of Agrajag, who's very mad, very mad. And he said, um, what do you think? What do you think of that? And I thought, this is a trick question. This is a trick question. And I said, um, it's very good. It's very good. He said, yes, but who do you think should play Agrajag? And I said, and I, I was really in the dark here. And he was obviously putting on a sort of Cleese-ish voice, John yes. Cleese-ish voice, because he was a big fan of Cleese. So I kind of said, John Cleese? And he said, no, you idiot, me, I want to play it. <laughs> so, oh, what an ass. So um, when it came to actually finally doing it 15 years later or so, um, I actually got permission to use Douglas's reading of the character and, you know, and cut out all the surrounding stuff and dropped him into the scene with Simon Jones as Arthur Dent, who encounters this creature who is convinced Dent is always trying to kill it, which is Agrajag and very funny. And so we actually were able to get uh, Douglas, uh, uh, Douglas in this, in, into it as an actor. And it was lovely and it was terribly sad. And there was Simon, playing along to a loudspeaker basically with this character we would move the loudspeaker on a stick around the room so that you, it kind of moves around in the stereo this thing hopping around on its webbed feet sort of getting really cross I, I, agrojag i think looks a bit like the beach ball in dark <laughs> yeah star, in dark you know? stuff yeah, yeah absolutely uh, that's kind of that with <laughs> those little web feet <laughs> anyway um and um it was, it was, it was kind of not a dry eye in the house. We, we what a, what a beautiful and, and bittersweet outcome, but it must've mm. been lovely for you. It must've been so wonderful for Simon. It must've, must've been an amazing moment. I mean, it was it great was. to hear, but to be there when you recorded, <laughs> it must've been something else. It was, and it was poignant. Um, but the great thing about having the, the original cast, cause we were all kind of mates anyway, cause I'd already been in touch with them. 12, 13 years before when we were going to do it. I mean, Peter Jones signed up and then he died. So we had to get someone else in. This, the, all this happened. But Simon was always up for it, really up for it. Jeff McGiven I'd known from other jobs. Susie, um, <laughs> Susie Sheridan, uh, who's so sadly no longer with us. Um, uh, but her daughter's just had a daughter and called it Susie, which is wonderful. Lovely. Yeah. Um, but, but we'd all kind of done this deal that if we did it, it would be them. That was yeah. a given. Um, but it was great having Simon, uh, particularly Simon and, and Mark, I think, because they would tell me if a line I'd inserted to smooth the point that we didn't have visuals to get through, they'd tell me if that, was if that wasn't maybe a bit too much information for the audience or maybe Douglas wouldn't have put it that way. So between the sort of virtual Douglas on my shoulder and them, I was able to channel how Douglas would have gone at it. So, yeah, I think in the end, it, it, it was as good as it could have been got without Douglas being there. And actually, to be fair, if Douglas had still been there, and please, I wish he could have been, we probably would still be editing it right now. <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's a beautiful outcome. Uh, and of course, you did a signing for the tertiary phase at Forbidden Planet. We did a signing of Forbidden Planet, and guess what, Andy? I've got it here. I've got a copy of the poster. I, I knew I could rely on you, mate. That's yeah. fantastic. It's, it was me, Steve, uh, moi, Stephen Moore, um, Jeff McGiven, and William Franklin, because Simon lives in New York. Um, and William Franklin was our Peter Jones. Of course, the, uh, the, the mighty successor. William Franklin. Yeah. The wonderful voice, and, an, and a mate with... Um, Peter. So uh, Bill was, you know, more than happy uh, to come and do it. Although, <clears throat> excuse me, um, 
uh, it was quite funny because, um, you, you know, Douglas writes the voice of the book in the books. When, when it's a descriptive passage, Douglas write, basically, it's like the spittoon joke. It, it's all one lump. Um, and, um, and, and it's just this, you know, kind of basically one sentence that's full of sort of sidebars and, and um, parentheses and, and points that you're making in parallel and so on. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, and so I remember there were, I've, I've got it somewhere, Bill, um, reading one of these and he goes through it faultlessly, hits every beat. And at the end, there's a moment he says, bloody hell, Dirk, <laughs> who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> and it's so, yeah, it's quite, it's quite funny. Oh, and, he, and he's, no, he's, it was, such, he's oh, such a great British. I mean, same way that Peter Jones was. I mean, oh, William yeah. Franklin had such real an old... iconic voice, you know. Schwartz really and all of that. solid yes yeah. just kind of that you know you, there was a kind of you know union jack if you cut him in off yeah. it's like a stick of rock yeah absolutely through. yeah no, no, no lovely man oh, so wonderful and, and so, something you touched upon before which i was thank you for sharing those memories of douglas that that, that that was wonderful and to cover off some other elements of your career of course while you're working for the bbc you you very famously produced that series of DC comics adaptations. Also, uh, uh, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it started off with your two kind of dramatized documentaries, Superman on Trial, then Batman, The Lazarus Syndrome. And then you got into Adventures of Superman, then Batman Nightfall. And then you flipped on to doing The Amazing Spider-Man, right? Yeah. And then you, yeah. then you closed out that sequence, as I recall, with Judge Dredd as well. Yeah, we did. We did. In fact, um... I've actually got here because I knew I'd be talking to you yeah. about this. This is actually uh, one of the two original masters. Oh, uh, lovely. I don't know if you can, hang on, where is it? Oh, yeah, it's, it's kind of the, the contrast is a bit high, possibly, but yeah, uh, yeah I can't do really do this. But anyway, that is. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, Superman. I can see it. Adventure uh, Superman on trial. Yeah. And this was, um, it is, you know, no digits here, matey. There's our editing report, tells you. You know, this is this is so fantastic. Copy of original, all of that, and um, we're on tape. Brilliant. We're on actual hanging off the spool tape, and this was the. Um, it's interesting looking back on this now, how we weren't working digitally at all at the BBC. Yeah. It was it was all tape machines, and it was really um, all done live in the studio and so on. But the, the, the conceit with Superman on trial, and this was actually when I'd, I'd actually got in touch with DC because I was working in Radio 2 Trails at the time, hoping to get into light entertainment. And they wanted to um, do some sort of crime, crime watch type of thing where you neighborhood watch kind of <clears throat> promotion. And I thought, well, make some trails with famous detectives in. And so Miss Marple, Poirot, Sherlock Holmes, and oh, Batman, he's a detective, let's do Batman. Um, and I was kind of like thinking, oh, better get permission for this, don't want to get wrong. So I rang DC Comics in New York. And obviously you're too young to remember this, Andy, <laughs> but in, those, in the late 80s, to ring, um, to ring America was an yeah. adventure, to ring Absolutely. DC Comics, to talk to somebody yeah. in that, Godly portal. Anyway, I rang him. I got put through to a lovely lady called Phyllis Hume. Oh, uh, yeah. A lovely lady story. indeed. Uh, a great yes, old friend indeed. of Forbidden Planets as well. Yeah, yeah. she's just the best. And a wonderful Brooklyn, yes. no-nonsense, dry-as-a-bone sense of humour. Yeah. Who you been? Where you been doing this week? Do it, well, I was talking to someone in Los Angeles. Ah, la-la land. <laughs> That's, yeah. That, before that became an expression. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, and, and Phyllis uh, said, oh, well, um, well, look, make it. And we've got somebody coming over to the Frankfurt Book Fair who's going to stop off in England so that they can listen to it. And if they'll clear it, you can use it. And this very nice lady called Chantal Dolny came in, who's, uh, I think Chantal's Belgian. She lives in Holland now, but she worked for DC. She came in and said, oh, it's really, really good. And she said, um, you know, uh, if you want any more ideas, um, uh, you know, uh, it's the birthday of Superman next year. It's his 50th birthday. And I kind of, and I, at this point I was applying for the job in Light Tent and I had to put in three program ideas. And I thought, oh, oh, there's a program idea. But I, di I didn't really figure out what it could be. But uh, this was it. And I'd made contact. 
so when it came to putting the program idea, I thought, well, I need an angle on this. I don't just want to do a documentary because we'd had a lot of fun in light entertainment. Uh, in uh, sorry, we'd had a lot of fun in Radio Two Trails, doing sort of. I, I do all the boring stuff, like not boring people, but Ken Bruce, lovely man, yeah, but yeah. you know, it's it's Ken Bruce. Yeah, you know? uh, but we'd save all the good ones for the afternoon. So if we were doing, for example, a license fee promotion, like save up for your license fee or get your tokens for it. I do, we do the one minute Lord of the Rings. In one minute, we do the whole Lord of the Rings. And of course, the, the, the goal is to get a license fee, not to get the, the one ring to rule them all. So we did all this nonsense. So I was into kind of, I wanted to do kind of drama uh, and I wanted to do comedy. So we got this, um, I put the idea into Light Entertainment of doing something about Superman. And then I was thinking, oh, um, what would be a good setup? Oh, Superman accused of crimes against humanity by interfering in our affairs. Oh, and Lois Lane as the defending counsel and Lex Luthor as the prosecuting counsel. And then it began to sort of all fall into place. And as evidence, you, you dramatize bits from the comics. So, you know, him coming to earth from Krypton and all of this stuff. And um, it was great because then you're thinking, oh, who else can we get in what other Batman's going to come and give evidence, but which way is Batman going to go? Cause Batman and Superman. Mm. And then there was this kind of, you know, Oh, and then I thought, Oh no, hang on a minute. I thought, no, we need real. It should be not just the people in the comic books should be people who make the comic books. So I booked up Dave Gibbons, who's been a mate ever since. who I know has talked to you in this series. Yeah. And we're still mates. Um, I think it's his turn for the pint this time. <laughs> um, it usually is. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Dave. Sorry, Dave. Um, and, um, and Dave uh, did that great Radio Times cover, didn't he? He did do the Radio Times. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Which, was, um, which I got in wonderful. big trouble over. Oh, really? I rang the Radio Times and I said, we're doing Superman. Do you fancy getting it on the cover? Um, and they said, wow, yeah. And so I rang Dave and said, Dave... <laughs> and anyway, and my boss took me in, Dirk, who can't go over my head getting Radio Times covers. You know, but radio only gets about three a year. And so I got one of the three Radio yeah. Times but covers. But it, it was a great cover. I mean, it's one of the best Radio Times covers anyway. I'd say that as a comics fan. But it really, it was. It really was very memorable. It was brilliant. I, I've, I've got it in the loo, but I'm, yeah. we're talking now, so I won't go and get it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> that, yeah, thanks for not going, Dirk. Um, <laughs> Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, no, so th this had all happened, but I got real people in. So Dave came in and gave evidence uh, uh, in defense. Jeanette Kahn of DC, who's the president at the time, came in and gave evidence. Well, we recorded it down the line and I cut her in. A, a noble tradition, which is carried on right now till recently with Sandman, with James McAvoy building his own vocal booth, just for us. Anyway, back to Jeanette. Um, and so, and I was, I was in the building still working on other stuff. And I heard that Adam West was dropping into Broadcasting House because they were just re-broadcasting re re Batman. And, um, and I thought, oh, that would be so cool if I could get Adam West in as well as Batman. And Adam and West could be reported to be shaking hands with Batman on the way out. And then, you know, there's a real meta kind of thing starting up. Um, and so he was going through Broadcasting House reception on his on his way into this like John Dunn show or something like that. I said, oh, excuse me, Mr. West, I'm really sorry to bother you. I'm, I'm doing a program about Superman and I would love to get literally five minutes of your time. And he said, sure, okay, okay, yeah, I can do that. I think my schedule will allow. So anyway, half an hour later, I'm outside Radio 2 hovering and I've booked a little studio and he comes out and I said, are we okay? He said, yeah, sure, come on. So we went up to this little studio and um, sat Adam West down and I just gave it, I, I'd written some questions. So I just, he just answered them. And, but my, the thing about Adam West was he was, he was as classy as he is in Batman. So I said something about how do you think, how would you feel if Superman wasn't allowed to help save the planet from itself? And he said, it was brilliant. He said, shattered, torpedoed, <laughs> riven. <laughs> it was like, wow. <laughs> I just love this guy's use of language. So, you know, Superman on trial was memorable because it got me the job. It, it got me friends with DC. And we made this, you know, this actually one hour thing. I, I overwrote, so we over recorded. And I, I, this is why I've got this other, this actual other copy 
was my sneaky one hour version. There are two of these tapes. Anyway, so we did that. I'm throwing my, I'm just throwing my props away as I carry on. I have many props. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, Radio 4 said, um, oh, got any more like that? And I said, well, it's Batman's birthday next year. Oh, right. Well, I have the same about Batman. So then Batman, the Lazarus syndrome came up. Similar thing. This time, somebody else is pretending to be Batman. And I wrote that with a guy called Simon Bullivant, really good comedy writer, who was also a mad keen comic book um, fan. Simon knew Batman backwards. So I, I always work with experts. Um, I, I thought I knew Batman backwards, but Simon seriously, I mean, you know, he knew his inside leg measurement. He was yeah, that right. Yeah. Yeah. Across it. So, uh, yes. It's not too bad. <laughs> anyway. So, um, uh, yeah. Anyway. So, um, we made Batman and, and it had gone so well. So then Radio 4 took the adventures of Superman. I took the adventures of Superman. We did two series of that. <clears throat> Excuse me, which are based on the John Byrne, Jerry Ordway stories yes, in the late course. 80s. Yeah, fantastic. Which reinvented after Crisis on Infinite yeah. Earths. Um, that, that that's, that's a great run <clears throat> and it's such a, such a great thing to dramatize, I think. Yeah, it was, it was good because we started from the beginning. Yeah. And then things went really quiet. There was a change of command at Radio 4. Michael Green, the lovely controller, moved on, I think. Um, and nothing much going on. And I was busy doing the Marx Brothers things. I was doing the Hud Lions. I mean, I was having the time of my life learning everything I know now from the business I learned in those days. Uh, <clears throat> and about 92, hitchhiker, when Hitchhikers fell over, I didn't know what the hell to do with myself. But... Um, I went off to do loose ends with Ned Sheeran, this sort of chat show on a live chat show on a Saturday morning and got Douglas in to do that. And Ned was desperate to ask Douglas about how, um, how come this hadn't happened because nice young Mr. Mags is working for us instead of with you. And, um, Douglas bless him had to quickly kind of, you know, sort of invent reasons why it didn't happen. But, um, I came out of uh, loose ends and I'm thinking, I, 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 I don't know what I'm going to do here. I was really at a loose end. And I thought, uh, one thing I could do maybe is more Superman if somebody would take it. And they just launched Radio 5. And in those days, it wasn't so much sport and talk. It was more talk and, yeah, bits of sport. Anyway, long story short, I had this idea. Uh, they called me in and they were willing to talk about it. And I said, wouldn't it be great to do something that actually it takes place as the comics are being released? And they said... Um, Okay, what do you have in mind? And I said, well, how about a Superman? There's a big storyline coming up with the death of Superman. So long story short, they said yes. And that's when I started using Dolby Surround because I was in the sound house where I was going to do uh, uh, Hitchhikers. And so the result of that was that we did um, this thing called Superman, the um, Superman Doomsday and Beyond. Yes. Here on, on beautiful analog cassettes i, I um, own them myself Fat, oh right. awesome. well there you go yeah <laughs> well to, to, i know a bloke who's got it digitally let, let me know later <laughs> thank you um anyway so uh, superman doomsday and beyond that went out and in the states and this is where i this is my what i wanted in the states it went out as superman lives that's ah, the u.s yes. release that's and lovely that is lovely yeah and that was the thing because they were and phyllis told me oh they're selling me like in kmarts and stuff like the 7-elevens and kmarts and you think now we're talking now we're talking so um and the adventures then the adventures was released on cd and so on. but it was going so well and then uh that happened and then radio one got a new controller i'm, I'm just going on and on here but i, I it love was, it bring it bring it on uh, this, all right well we want to talk about Matthew Bannister joined Radio One right. and sacked all the old DJs, all the dodgy, you know, blokes from Top of the Pops that they can't show anymore. Um, uh, he <laughs> sacked them all. The smashing you know. nicey brigade, right? It was, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. There were some nice guys, but there was all sort of terrible old cheese. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mm. had to live through that era as well. So, uh, you know, yeah, I know yeah. exactly who you're talking about. Radio is yes. better without them, I'm sure. Well, I think it was, but Matthew got a lot of stick, a lot yeah. of stick. And he came into light entertainment and he was looking for a new daily serial. He said, I want to do a, 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 I want to do a daily serial. I want to do a serial on radio, on radio one. I need something really cutting edge and this, that, and the other. And I'm going into this meeting and there's like Amanda Yanucci is one of my, 
you know, colleagues at that time. And Lissa Evans, who's now a novelist and went on to do Father Ted and Amundo, you know, who's now God Almighty and does everything. And all these other really talented people, David Tyler and all this stuff. And I'm, I'm thinking, I don't belong here. You know, this is too, you know, they're going to go for some slice of life, gritty, realistic um, uh, drug addicts living in a, a, a squat, kind of you know bbc social messaging stuff and i just thought well, i'll just sit this dance out anyway so matthew tells us you know i want to do a drama i want it to be cutting edge i want it to really rock and um so he goes around the room and everybody and up comes you know the the, the squat and the druggies and the what have you and so on and, so on. and i'm thinking what time's lunch Pop <laughs> down. i think i might hit the pub and um and then uh uh, nothing comes up and he says Dirk what about you you're at the back there hiding what have you got and I, I knew that there was a Batman storyline that was kind of as apocalyptic as the Superman and Doomsday storyline so I just said well I'd offer you a Batman and he said that's it and I'm like yes <laughs> yes and then he said he said you know which is always be careful what you wish for he said um, can you do it in three minute, de- three minute episodes daily? <laughs> and I went, yes. And I, <laughs> and I, and I, I walked out and go, oh my God, what have I done? What have I done? And anyway, it was the best possible format for, for it. And when I realized later on, because the, the three minute format, um, which started with Batman Nightfall, although we retroactively did it with the Supermans. But I was, <clears throat> I realized that a comic book, it, you have to write it like a comic book. In a comic book, you've got your, your cover, which grabs you, then you open it to a splash page, that grabs you, and then you open it, and then you start getting the panels on each page. And at that point, the, the way a comic book is written is to suck you in. You want to keep turning the pages, and at the bottom, you know, of your... Of, of a two page spread the frame at the bottom right down there is the one that's going to make you want to turn the yeah, page for sure and that's where where robin goes <gasps> or whatever you know it, it can be anything it can be what the it could it doesn't matter it's just you've got to want to turn that page and that became how i constructed these three minute episodes it was kind of like an episode a page roughly if you like or, or for every two pages and you you first of all you hit the ground running any backstory you deal with while you're moving forward into the front story. Um, you, so you've caught up while you're heading for something like in the Batmobile, then you do a big story beat and then you end it with some kind of cliffhanger. It doesn't have to be big, but just enough to make you want to know what happens next. And, and, and it just translated so beautifully to sound. I knew comics and sound work well together because of the previous time I've done. But Nightfall, it really bloody worked. It was, it was brilliant. Um, I mean, I say this myself yeah. and shouldn't, but it really worked. I was I, like, I agree with you, mate. I agree with you. I, I think is is that of all your kind of comic oeuvre, is is that the uh, the thing that is that the the, the piece that you're most proud of? Uh, out of my comic oof, yes. I think you, yeah. yeah, so my comic yeah. oof. I think in, in a way it kind of is uh, up till Sandman, probably, yeah. yeah. It, it, it just really, it was magic. And also I was working with Scott Peterson and Denny O'Neill, you know, they were, oh, they wow. were, it, yeah. and Charlie Kochman at DC. Yeah. So, so I kind of had this, this, um, you know, this hotline to, to sort of Batman Central. And in fact, it was so sweet because later on, um, they actually put me in a panel on a great. comic book page. Oh, that is great. Hey, that is so that, sweet. Yeah, no, no, no better compliment than that. That's fantastic. I, it really was. And, um, and also the best fun was ringing Scott Peterson's phone because he had Mark Hamill as the Joker. Oh, going, yeah. Hello, we've kidnapped Scott Peterson. And so <laughs> you'll have to leave message. Yeah, but it's really funny. So... Um, that was kind of, that was brilliant. We had this run of Batman, then we uh, did Spidey. So let's talk about Spidey for a second. Yeah. And then, because you touched on Sam, I, 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 I want to get into that. So of yeah. course, Spidey, you, you worked with Brian May on that, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Terrible man, terrible man. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> well, he's a, I mean, put it this way, you know, I am a drummer, yeah. Andrew. So for a guitarist, he's all right. <laughs> 
they're suckers. Yeah. Yeah. I know the reality is that you and he are great friends, and of course, yeah, you yeah. are one half. You're you're one of his two great comic book collaborations. The other one being Flash Gordon, of course. Yes, uh, for yes. which he he was the composer of, as I'm sure you know, but he's the composer of the the timeless Flash Gordon theme. He great, wore out Roger's great, right foot. Yeah, <laughs> a dum -bum -bum. And that great <laughs> piano chord, the crash chord. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, uh, no, no, I mean, yeah, Bry is, Bry is all over popular culture like we are. And um, in fact, wasn't my idea. What happened was uh, we would do all this stuff at DC and a lovely guy called Tim Quinn, who was editing at Marvel at the time, got in touch and said, why aren't you doing Spidey? And I said, well, can we? He said, yeah. Uh, and this at that time, Marvel was much more laissez-faire and flexible. And Tim and Tim's and it was Tim who got in touch with Brian. Um, and uh, and so uh, we set this meeting up with Brian to go down to Brian's place in uh, Surrey, this sort of rather stately pile. Um, and um, it was it was really magic actually. Brian was all all about you know oh this sounds really fun this sounds so and um, so it was it was really promising and I had a, a Spidey in mind there was an actor I couldn't get for Robin called William DeFries, Bill DeFries and I said to him Bill I've got another project coming up I've really got you in mind for and he's you know afterwards he told me um I heard that so many times I didn't believe you but when I say that I really do mean it you know um so uh, you know I knew the Spidey I wanted and then Tim brought Brian in and um, and we went down to Brian's and uh, chatted and, um, uh, and, uh, and 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 Brian said, "I'll do you a little tune. I'll do you a tune." So um, I said, "Right, great, great, you know." And then this cassette arrives in the post, and it goes, Burn up. and I'm like, "Yeah," and. <laughs> And I was pulling through it thinking, something not right here. And I turned it over, spooled it through. No, it's just... Burn up. Anyway, um, <laughs> and so I think it might have... Ba -da 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 something like that. Anyway, so I, I, I very cautiously emailed and said, um, Brian, is, is there more to the tune? He said, oh, yeah, yeah. No, that's just the, you know, that's the, the key, the, the little key light motif thing. But because the other thing was, it was all on keyboard. So I said, um, and I'm thinking, oh my God, he's hung the bloody guitar. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> yeah. So I said, the, the red like, special's well, been retired and he's doing it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, and it's, you know. <laughs> Which would, would, I'm sure wasn't what you wanted to hear. You know, you thought, I've got Brian May. You well, want the Brian May guitar, right? Yeah, you do want the red special, don't yeah. you? So um, I said, have you um, hung the guitar up since Queen? He said, no, no, no. I'm, you know, I just, I wanted to hear the tune. So I was like, Oh, thank God. Anyway, and then he sent me the full one and it was all the, the full, you know, nine Vox AC30s yeah. cooking eggs. The full yeah. Brian May, fantastic. The full Brian May. So, it, you know, that was fantastic. And, and, and the cast, you know, we had this... It, Spidey, I loved when I was a kid. I loved DC and Marvel. And the thing about Spidey was it was that refreshing irreverence of Spidey. And I remember, you know, Stanley and Steve Ditko, their style was so kind of hip and on it and I, the, my favorite thing as a kid there was a scene where you get used to superman in the 50s or, or from the 50s comics being rather sort of stolid and you know there's, there was an artist called wayne boring who draws drew superman and i you know i hate to say it wayne but yeah yeah anyway well wayne so, boring superman kind of looks like a statue of superman rather than yeah, he, yeah a, you know a he, living breathing superhuman he, he, he that's he's it. almost kind of carved from granite isn't he and very you know he looks he looks like a wardrobe yes absolutely basically. yeah yeah <laughs> and uh, yeah um anyway uh so um you know i was used to all that and then stan lee and steve ditko are doing spider-man and there's this kid and he swings in through the window i remember this one always and this i read this one I was about eight swings in through a window and there's a burglar at a safe and Spidey switches on his belt light that, you know, limes the, the, the burglar in um, a Spider-Man, you know, logo. And, Sp and, and, and Spidey says, don't give me any trouble because my ever readies are about to run out. <laughs> and he's like, his batteries are going to go flat. And I yeah. just, that was so cool. The whole, the, I just fell in love immediately with it's Lee that, and Ditko. That, it's those incredible Ditko visuals married yeah. to that unique, 
hit flip stand dialogue and the two together you know it's a pure distillation of the mid to late 60s almost you know it, it uh, absolutely was well and this was like 63 yeah you know so it, it was before the irreverence had crept into popular culture yeah it, it was magic but um you know with all that and bill de Vries, who sadly uh, passed away three months ago from cancer bless him but he just came in he was like a bundle of energy and he was like okay yeah well you know and it was it was real good peter parker stuff it was it was absolutely on a level with anything that um uh, you know have we had tom holland and andrew garfield and toby Maguire? it was in that league superb and it was just we had the it was a riot in fact at the end of um, spidey there is the blooper reel is actually part of the credits because also we had Michael Roberts, who is, was Groucho in our flywheel things, or the Groucho character, um, coming in as Doctor Doom, who played as Vincent Price. Oh, and he fantastic. Gets, he gets lost in the middle of this huge threat. He's, you know, he's monologuing away at Spider-Man. And, 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 and for those who enjoy home shopping, we have a whole line of nuclear submarines. <laughs> it's just That's brilliant. brilliant. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. So yeah, lots of comic stuff. Here. Yeah, Enjoy. and such what such wonderful comic stuff, and that of course it gives us a beautiful point of transition into your latest project, which people have gone absolutely bananas for, quite rightly, which is yeah. uh, your Audible adaptation of the Sandman, which you've been working on for years and, and can now talk to everybody out with an amazing yeah. all-star cast. So, so please, what, what was the genesis of, of that project? Uh, this goes right back to the beginning of my, you know, time talking to DC. Within the next, a year of beginning to talk to DC and Phyllis Hume in particular, International Affairs, you know, um, she, she, uh, would, we'd have conversations about my kids or how life was in Brooklyn or how many bodies the mob had left at the end of her street that week or whatever it was, you know, it's great. Um, and she said, um, so you you know Neil Gaiman, right? I said, sorry? And she said, you know Neil Gaiman? I said, is he English? She said, yeah. I said, I, I know it's a small island, uh, but actually, Phyllis, we don't know everybody else. Don't know everybody yeah. here. Uh, yeah, don't know everybody. Anyway, she said, no, no, he's, he's a genius, and he does this, he does that. And by then, Sam had been going for about two years. I think it was about 1990. And she um, sent me, you know, the first uh, two or three collected editions, probably up to Dream Country. And, um, and I read it and I just, I was blown away, totally blown away. And she sent me his email address. So I think I emailed him. It was probably about 91, 92. Um, and it was before I'd got things going again on the Superman front. Um, and... I just, I emailed him, I said, this is amazing. Would you, would it be okay with you if we tried to get it as an audio thing? And he said, well, it would be fine by me, but I don't know how DC would go. But we kind of, so we, we were in contact with each other. Anyway, long story short, BBC weren't interested. They'd not heard of this guy, Neil Gaiman. And, you know, it was very, it was uphill going, but they were happy to take more Sandman's, uh, more Superman's and Batman's. And I was happy enough with that. But over the next 28 years, I must have taken Sandman in every five, six years to try and flog it again, because I knew it could be brilliant. And Neil was up for it. And DC at that time were still friend, you know, were still in New York, and they were they weren't quite as corporate as they are now. But actually, that that's changed a bit. But there was a, a period when DC Warner's hadn't taken over and were, you know, yeah. it was still quite loose and still quite experimental. Of, yeah, there was a bit of kind of hippie philosophy there, which is, you know, yeah. if if you really want to go for it, you do it. Um, anyway, so I tried to do it over and over again, and. Um, I did tell this story on Facebook the other day, you know, I, 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 one of my last meetings where I tried to pitch it, the commissioning editor said to me, well, you know, Dirk, um, having killed all of these, you know, things that I'd labored so hard to, to write things about and construct how it was going to happen and budget and so on, just tossing them in the waste bin casually. And then the last one that go in is Sandman. And I'm like, Come on, man. And he says, well, you know, Dave, there's an awful lot, of, awful lot of younger producers in your rear view mirror now uh, coming up behind you. And I'm thinking, that is no way to motivate me to come and pitch stuff to you. Yeah, right. uh, it really was bad. The, the, um, the polar opposite, in fact. 
it, yeah, I mean, you, you know, so fine. I'll, I don't know. I, in fact, I think I did say to him, to, and I don't, you know, I wouldn't do this, but I said, fine, I'll go home and polish my awards then. Yeah. You know, because you're like, <laughs> hang on a minute, mate. Hang on. I've earned this. So um, it all kind of came to a grinding halt. And then we were actually did a stage tour of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy um, in the early uh, part of this decade or the, the decade just gone. And, um, and uh, I got an email from a, a radio drama producer called Heather Lama, who was working in BBC Northern Ireland, who, who also pitched into Radio 4. And she put in the idea of doing Neil's Neverwhere as a drama. And Neil was fine about it, but he said, can you get Dirk in to adapt it? And I said, well, if I'm adapting it, could I co-direct it with you? I thought I might as well be cheeky. And she was lovely. And she said, yes, because she's Irish and just like that, you know. Um, and we turned into a little sort of triumvirate, Neil, Heather and me. And we turned out Neverwhere, which was amazing because I walked into the read through for that. And um, I got a sense of the power that Neil had got over the intervening 20 years since we first pitched Sandman. Because there's a table read and I'm sitting there. And next to me is Natalie Dormer. Next to her is James McAvoy, Sophie Ocanido. Benedict Cumberbatch, um, Andrew Sachs, Bernard Cribbins, Johnny Vegas, David <laughs> Harewood, and down the end of the table, Sir Christopher Flipping Lee. <laughs> and that's the cast for a radio thing. Yeah. And I, I said, we, we kind of read two or three scripts and broke for a coffee. And um, James came up and, you know, James is great. This is the first time I met him and I realized what a cool bloke he is because he came up and he saw, he comes up and says, Derek, you know what, my character's a right whinging bastard in episode three. Can we change that a wee bit? And, I, and, I'm, and I'm thinking, well, Neil's not here. Yeah, yeah, let's change it. Um, and, um, and I said to him, so I said, um, I, I've, I've got to ask you, man, you, you, you could be earning telephone numbers in Los Angeles and you're here doing this with us on, you know, radio drama feeds. Um, and he said, yeah, but I love this shit. <laughs> and it was you know and it was it's like great. yeah that's why they're all in here even yeah. be, you know benedict and i mean benedict was great he, he's like he's so easy in fact when it was all over in the afternoon instead of going outside and wait for his cab he helped us uh, tidy up the coffee cups fantastic so, i mean you what know, a great story yeah that's very heartening yeah. to hear that a brilliant story like that actually mate yeah he's a, these are good guys and um so I realized what a pull Neil had. And the thing is, Neil and Heather and I became this sort of trio. And we did uh, this, we did then, we did Good Omens, uh, Neil and Terry's Good Omens. We did Stardust. Uh, we did How the Marquis Got His Coat Back, which is a sort of novella uh, sequel to Neverwhere. And then finally, I adapted a Nancy Boys. Heather had moved on and I adapted Nancy Boys, a Nancy Boys uh, for drama. Um, at which point I thought, probably that's it if I'm not working with Heather. Nothing wrong with the producer who took over, but you kind of get so used to working with one person that it's kind of hard. Um, and so things went very quiet and I was sort of licking my wounds a bit at the end of 2017 because I was kind of was sorry Heather had gone I felt we'd lost something and I was looking at Twitter this was like mid-December 2017 and you know Neil and I follow each other and stuff and so on and so on and uh, on Twitter somebody asked Neil oh you know when will we see the Sandman or whatever it is and when will it finally be adapted into another medium and I think it's in another medium rather than just TV, you know, which is the default thing. And, um, and Neil said, it's not really my gift, you know, I, you know, I'd love it to happen. It's not in my gift. And I immediately think of all the times I go in with Neil's blessing to sell it and no one will take it. I think, oh, you know, I wish I, if only, if only the BBC just would take something I know is going to revolutionize their audience because we proved how good Neil was, but they were still going on and please give us listeners on radio four, give us listeners under 45. Yeah. Okay. And I've got the Sandman. I yeah. know we can deliver that. And of all ages, no, wouldn't take it. So I'm like, Oh, well, never mind. Blow me down two days later. An email comes from Sandy Resnick. Our mutual friend, in fact, Sandy Our Resnick. mutual, lovely yeah. friend at yeah. DC Comics, who was, you know, working in uh, international rights with Phyllis. He was making the tea and shining people's shoes, you know, and he's worked his way up now to, you know, holy and invisible oneness. Yes. Um, 
in quite in rightly so is, and quite rightly so fine fine man fine man um a man who Sandy... took my dad out for lunch one day by the way Sandy really? Reyes, such a lovely guy yeah oh, yeah he took my dad good. on a tour of the dc offices and uh, took him out for a big slap up lunch and what my, my dad still my my dad's pushing 90 now still talks about sandy to this day you know such oh. a lovely bloke yeah, well, he's obviously nicer than you or I. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> I'm not saying your dad out for lunch. <laughs> anyway, no, no, but seriously, but seriously. Um, and Sandy uh, sent this email saying, hey, Derek, how are you doing? Long time, no talk. And he said, I've noticed on uh, Neil's timeline the other day on Twitter that, you know, he's talking about Sam Mann. And, um, you know, I'm kind of wondering whether maybe DC should allow you to do it. And I'm thinking... Can't I mean, pinch me, pinch me? And he said, "Do you want to? Do you want to ask Neil if you'd be interested?" So, I thought, okay, well, I'll you know, I'll I'll email Neil. So I emailed Neil and I said, "DC are asking if you would like to collaborate with me to do an audio Sandman." And you know, Neil is a man of few words, but he's a very erudite man, and his words, when they are few, are well considered. And he just came back and he said. Flip, yeah, but he didn't say flip. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, and it was it was so fast and so funny. It killed great. me, you know. This great writer, just like yeah. yeah. Anyway, so we were underway, and then it was a case of finding a publisher to to do it. And and Sandy said, "How about the BBC?" And I said, "Well, I, to be honest with you, we could wait six months and still get a turn down." And I'd already started working. There was a guy called Steve Carsey from Audible who poached me to start doing these alien dramas based on Titan books um, by Tim Levin and Chris Golden and, and James uh, Moore. And, um, and uh, so we, you know, we had a big success with these Audible aliens. And Steve, you know, believed in my audio movie approach to doing things. But in our very first meeting, Steve had said, you know, I'd love to be doing the sort of comic book stuff you do like Sandman. So I thought... I've got a friend in Audible who's Steve who might take this. And, and Sandy, we, we talked about this and he said, well, I, I ought to, you know, we can't just go to one person. We should talk to others. So we kind of went through the potential audio publishers. But in the end, you know, Audible, yes, it is a subscription thing. But on the other hand, it's a bit like the Medici's could afford to pay for this, you know, for, for Leonardo to do the last supper or whatever. I'm, yeah. I'm, Christ's sake, don't fact check, check me, please. <laughs> um, you know, in the end, you need a patron and Audible would be the patron. And so we finally flipping did it. And we were in studio. I did the adaptations a year ago and, um, and, um, and I, I just started writing it and news came through that Netflix were also going to do a TV show. I think DC having decided we're going to, you know, have something happen. Yeah, well, audio, yeah, but you know, TV. And it was a bit of a blow because I thought, ah, because because audio is and TV can coexist very happily, but there is a kind you don't want to get too close to the wake of their ocean liner in your trim little yacht because it will sink you. Yes. So I'm thinking this isn't good news. Um, and then I thought, well, hang on a minute, it's television. And television takes liberties with stuff because it does. It's the nature of the beast. They will change stuff, even if Neil is involved. And I knew Neil was going to be involved with, with me on this because yeah. he, he would be even if, if they didn't officially make him the exact producer because he's a mate and we worked on it long enough. We need to do it together. But I thought, I think what I have to do is, is have a unique selling point here. And I'd started the first episode and I'd slightly juxtaposed events and done off scene um stuff on uh, you know, on scene as it were you know where where you think or oh, something must have happened here to trigger this moment i thought and i just tore all that up and i uh, emailed neil i said look you know this tv thing is it's happening he said yeah and i said you're involved he said yeah he said and i said well look i think this is a real my cue to start over on this and I think the closer I cleave to what you originally wrote, the better for everybody. Because if if you're going to change things for the TV version, are you? And he said, well, yes, basically, we're going to bring it up to date. Um, you know, there's going to be set in present day. The, the, the origins of Sandman will be in 1916 or whatever, but they're going to bring it up to date. So I'm thinking, fine. So they're going to have cell phones. They're going to have the internet. The characters are going to live in that world. And I thought, fine. Everybody knows and loves the Sandman as it was written between 1988 and 1995. So I'm going to set it in its original period. 
and what I need, but I just needed this one extra unique thing. And the unique thing I thought of was, and I said to Neil, I said, have you got your original scripts that you sent to the writers, uh, to the artists and the inkers and everybody, and to Todd Klein who did the lettering? He said, yeah. I said, can I have them? Can I use them? Because I thought, I'll get all his descriptions of what he wants to see on the page. And so, and, and Neil had already said to me, and we, we, we are now having, not having an argument sort of with each other, but on social media, he's now saying, I asked him to be narrator, but I swear blind, I have an email where he says, can I be narrator? <laughs> so this, there will be right. a reckoning. There yes. will be a reckoning with him. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so uh, he sends me this stuff. And it was like, it was so much better than I thought it would, could possibly be because he goes, he's writing his heart out into the descriptions for the, for the artists. No one's read this stuff. I mean, I think he published maybe a couple in, at the backs of them, but all this stuff and some of it's poetry. I mean, his language, the way he describes stuff, because Neil can't not be a writer. Yeah. Eve, I'm sure his shopping lists probably scan, you know, like some sort of, you know, pen, iambic pentameter, you know. Um, dozen eggs, yeah. and, and <laughs> copy of the Racing Post. Um, yeah. You know, uh, so um, there's all these descriptions, and literally, I'm thinking, well, you know what? I just changed a few tenses here, uh, verb tenses, or or I just put a, a he instead of an I, or you know. And so I had my narrative narrative voice, which is Neil writing it at his desk in 1988 or 1989 or whenever it is, and it's Neil's real voice from the time and it reads beautifully and in fact on i think it was into the night episode 16 we've done the first 20 stories so far um it reads like um under milk wood by by uh dylan thomas it's just poetry it's beautiful so this was so we've got and this was the thing and it was kind of when we released you know it's now a few weeks since it was released and I'm slightly, you know, my wife is going, are you all right? Because I'm going around twitching slightly because I'm thinking, right, it was released at eight this morning. I'll start hearing things at about sort of um, eight tonight, you know, for the ones who listen all the through. And it started coming through and people were loving it. Yeah. You know, there's the odd one or two who are going to cough. But really, I've never, ever had a reaction. to The reaction's been phenomenal. Yeah. And, um, and uh, it's something I'm very much looking forward to digging into myself. I haven't had the chance to listen to it yet. But I yeah. know just from looking at who you've cast, it, as, that, as that array of characters that I really care about, like every hardcore com comics I really care about, cares about, every time I saw who you cast as that specific character, I was just thinking, hey, that's it, he's done it again. You know, and mm. uh, and uh, you you're really talking a list blue chip actors. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I think I, I just can't. I mean, Cat Dennings is death, amazing. You know, just just great. Well, that was Neil. That was Neil because we had the, a, a list of of actresses of every ethnicity, every culture. And the, I think the only one we didn't have was Inuit. I mean, literally, we had actresses from all over, and it was this. How, where where do we even go on this? And Neil just said, you know, um. I really think Kat Dennings has got the right voice for it. And, and, I, and then I saw, so I checked her out on YouTube, two broke girls. And yeah. um, the, when she's Natalie Portman's sort of sidekick in the yeah. Thor movies. Yeah. And she's Nick and Nora's infinite playlist. Yeah. Yes. Great film. She, I, uh, Julie taken tip yeah. taken. Mr. Oh yeah. It's very, well worth seeing. Well worth seeing. Right. Well, anyway, I listened to this stuff. I thought, yo, yeah, I like this. This is fresh. She's got a fresh sort of sound to her. I think we could do something here. And, um, and she was very keen to do it. And I went, flew to Atlanta to do her cause she was shooting out there. Um, and she was actually had done a night shoot. She didn't know she was going to get a night shoot the night, the night before the day we recorded, but she came in as fresh as a daisy and she just took the material and made it her own. And it's a bit like working with James when you have an actor with the intelligence and the energy to make something their own from the off. They've thought about it. They know how they're going to go at it and so on. And the only bit of direction I gave her was how to correctly say supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> I'm doing it like an expialidocious. She was just great. Uh, you know, you, you kind of meet Kat, you fall in love with her straight yeah. away. She's such a nice person. And uh, that was the same. The whole cast, everybody has been utterly charming. And of course, James McAvoy is Morpheus. 
who was always kind of there in my mind because I know James can do anything. He's like a Swiss a wonderfully, Army knife. wonderfully versatile actor. I've been fortunate enough to see him on the West End a bunch of times and he's just great. He, he can do anything, that lad. He, he can do... <laughs> Take two. <laughs> He can do anything, and 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 he's you know he's 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 on he's like a boxer in the studio. He's sort of on his toes, ready for a you know to go at the next thing. And I just love that energy. And it's this, and the thing about Morpheus is the character is kind of static. It's it's a presence. You know, he's an he's an he's a immortal sort of what is, what does that say? An anthropomorphical um, personification of a thought which is how the hell do you act that but james has got this energy so even when dream isn't doing anything you know he's there james is just bringing this sort of fisting like a little ball of energy in the corner of the room and that's what's so great about how he plays it and all the casting you know taron edgerton he really is just john constantine great. oh wow and yeah. his mum and dad are geordie yeah. well you know this you know his mum and dad are from the world, yeah, and he's from like just my mum and dad, yeah, I, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I uh, know. Yeah. I mean, so, I'm, I'm very excited by it. Uh, that piece of casting. I thought was fantastic. Very excited yeah. by that. And he was good too. In fact, he was a. Frankly, Tarrant is a bit of a pain in the ass because he's so good. I didn't know which takes to use. He kept giving me a different reason. All of them were brilliant. It was just I loved his energy. Sh surely it would be. I would have thought a great future project for for you would be to adapt the Garth Ennis run on Constantine with uh, Taron playing the part. You know, that well, would be that would be phenomenal. It has been it, it's uh, I've seen several people have yeah, mentioned it on yeah, Twitter. Good. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I'm, and they're very wise. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not privy to the workings of where we go next. I suspect it'll be no, I can't even say anything. Yeah. No, but I, I suspect things will happen. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I, I, whatever those things are, I, I very look, I very much look forward to them, mate. Thank you so much for sharing this hour with us to My celebrate Forbidden pleasure. Planet Forty Two. I only wish we had another. I mean, I know we do in real life outside of this venue. Oh yeah, yeah. definitely over a pint. When we're oh, sat down over a pint. Yeah. I yeah. didn't even do this. Yet. I didn't do my. Oh yeah. Coconut shells. I mean, come on. Yeah. You know, this is. That's the only sound effect you need, really. Uh, the thing that is, will be a cushion. The thing is, FP42 is giving birth to FPTV. So, so what we're going to be doing is is running this as a as a regular online channel to Great. announce new stuff in the in in a, you know post pandemic world where we might not be doing signings for a while. We're going to be doing this instead. So, I would love it if you came and joined us again, mate. That would be fantastic. Oh, I'd love it. Yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully there'll be more to talk about, Andy. Well, yeah. that's what I'm hoping. <laughs> that is absolutely the message I'm receiving. That's what I'm drinking <laughs> in from this conversation. <laughs> well, I'm living in hope. Let's let's yeah. let's put it that way. Yeah. I'm, fantastic. I'm Thank sure you. it will happen, mate. I, I just I can't and I can't wait to hear it. Your stuff is always so inspired, and I know from personal experience that you're such a pleasure to work with. You know, so, well, uh, you know, we, we, we go back a long way and I'm sort yeah. of actually, um, I, I, you know, I, I kind of always think that, you know, we, we so nearly at, at other times managed to, yeah, you know, kind of pull stuff off that we didn't think right. was possible. Yeah. But we did, didn't we? We, we actually, did you know, yeah. we, we made a uh, Sexton Blake uh, for uh, which, years ago, which was delightful. Thing. Which was it was as mad as anything can possibly yeah. get. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's um, well worth checking out. It, yeah, it's yeah. still available. Go and get it from Amazon. Sexton Blake, amazing. Yeah, yeah, Adventures of Sexton Blake Detective, yeah. starring Simon Jones. No, Simon who's Jones, Arthur Dent in Hitchhikers, who, who did such an amazing job. Yeah, yeah. No, I, oh. I, I remember those times very fondly. And thanks again for for coming here and spending this time with us mate you take care of yourself and all i'm going to say now is you have been watching the impeccable dirk mags <laughs> here <laughs> on <laughs> fp42 we will see you in the store take care of yourselves and uh, another tip of that to that to the great douglas adams uh dirk's Absolutely. friend and it's so good yeah. to see you mate you take care of yourself you too Andy. all the best thank pal you. cheers mate take care bye bye, bye. <laughs>